How a Romance Novel Saved the Galaxy by Ariana de Ralte. Chapter 54, Obi-Wan 3. There was a certain stark beauty to Mandalore's wastelands. Obi-Wan was certain that several hundred years ago that hadn't been the case. Boar had suggested he ask Master Fay for advice on his Verdigoten, and her calm had been very explicit about him avoiding the few spots that still contained, as she called it, psychic backlash from the Force. Those were places where too many beings had died suddenly in the Jalhan. Otherwise, her advice had been to heed the Force for his needs. So that was what Obi-Wan was doing, letting the Force guide his steps past large craters and into a series of canyons running through tall cliffs. Holbur had made sure he was otherwise prepared. He had a blaster in addition to his lightsaber. He had the tracker in his clan's sigil on his belt, and he had enough water to blast him the full three days, since unpoisoned water was rare and far between. He'd been trained by his babur in hunting and survival. Holbur had even insisted he bring sunscreen, though Obi-Wan had argued he could just use his cloak for shade. He'd been briefed on strills in case he actually encountered an extant pack of the carnivorous mammals, so that was deemed extremely unlikely to happen. There were still supposedly some wild packs in the northern regions of the planet, but there just wasn't the prey available to sustain strills in the wasteland. Obi-Wan didn't expect to encounter any animals larger than a shriekhawk, and more than likely he wouldn't see anything at all. Master Fay had said there were some rodents and insects in the wasteland, but nothing else. Obi-Wan set up camp the first evening in a location that was defensible from predators, but also sheltered from the winds that were raging across the wastes today. He was very hungry. He'd used the force to catch some insects he'd been told were safe to eat, but they tasted awful! So tonight, he'd used what his babur had taught him and set up some simple deadfall and snare traps several meters away from his camp in the hopes of getting at least a small mammal to eat. With the help of the force, he could still make it through the three days without food easily enough, but he'd been taught how to hunt and cook by his babur, so it would be nice to say he had used those skills as part of his burdgoten. Once he was out of the wind, it wasn't cold enough to need to do more than huddle in his cloak for warmth, so he settled down without a fire. It was easy enough to start one with his lightsaber or even his blaster, but it wasn't like there was a lot of wood lying around in a desert wasteland, especially since he'd had to use any wood he found to make his traps for game. It was just before dawn, with the light of the sun illuminating the sky but not yet having risen over the horizon, when he was awakened by the force prodding him. Something drew him over towards his traps. He climbed up over the edge of the rocks he was sheltering behind, then froze. The creature attempting to lift the heavy rock he'd used for a deadfall was huge. Golden fur ran up its back into the top of its long whip-like tail, while heavy leathery folds of skin protected its sides and six legs. The wind shifted, and it turned a snarl at him, a great tongue just visible in a mouth of sharp teeth. Golden eyes stared at him intelligently. A pungent smell hit him. It was a strill. Obi-Wan kept still, using his senses to stretch out and find the rest of the pack. He was puzzled that the forest told him they were alone, but it also directed his focus to the strill's legs. One was limp and dragging on the ground, while another ended in a gruesome stump. He met the Strill's golden eyes, reaching out with the Force. He knew there were Jedi who were trained in beast mastery, though there was certainly nothing else he knew about it. Still, Master Fate had said he was good at reaching out to others with the Force, so he did so now. The beast stopped snarling, but Obi-Wan's mind was occupied with the image of the Strill several days before being the victim of a rock slide. The rest of the pack got free, but the strill was tucked under a boulder and left for bed by the rest of the pack. The strill had chewed off one leg and dragged out the other from under a boulder, but now they were having trouble hunting, and they needed the food, and it turned out they were pregnant with pups. There was a sense of desperation about them and loneliness from being separated from their pack. Well, their food problem was easy enough to solve. Obi-Wan could live without whatever he caught for the day. He used the force to lift the deadfall rock, which caused the strill to startle, then look between him and the rock with a puzzled look. 
but the moment the rock was laid to the side, the stroke pounced on the squished rodent underneath, eating it in just a few gulps. Obi-Wan kept one eye on the stroke while he checked the other three traps. Two were empty, one triggered and the insect bait gone, while the third had a larger squished insect with the bait insect in its mouth. Obi-Wan offered both to the Strill, who ate it with the same grimace on their face as Obi-Wan had yesterday. Obi-Wan had to smile at how they both thought the insects tasted awful. He didn't really know what else he could do for the creature. He didn't know which way the other Strills had gone, and he didn't have any extra food. Do you need water? He mentally asked the question, but the Strill studied him for a long moment before turning up its nose and walking away. His second day was spent following the force deeper into the canyons. He was lucky enough to surprise a vivine rodent popping out of its burrow. He used the force to hold it still while he cut it and quickly broke its neck, feeling a bit of a pang as the loss of life echoed in the force. Still, surviving out here was his mission as a Mandalorian, especially since he'd given all his food to the Strill this morning. Obi-Wan would have to report on their presence when he was done here and hope that the Mandalorians could find them before they and their developing pups could die. From what he had read, the ancient Mandalorians had used them as hunting companions, so they'd probably welcome a pregnant strill with open arms, especially since they were hermaphrodites, so this strill could breed with any strill still extant in the galaxy. Obi-Wan felt good that he'd have something interesting to report to Amara Ni, at least. He felt less good about it when he was settling in for the night, traps set and baited, with little bits of the vivine this time. He was just about to start a fire to cook the rest of it when the strill strode right into his camp area, turned around a couple of times, and settled it right next to him, its golden fur brushing up against his side. It was quite prickly. He sighed and tossed the vivine to the strill, who ate it in one gulp, then began to use its long tongue to clean the hair on its rump, moving on to the edge of his robes. Obi-Wan tried hard not to gag at the stench of its breath. We'll see if I have more food for you in the morning. Try not to eat me while I sleep, please. The strill sent back the picture of him and a pup, so we guessed he was being called a child. It seems that like the Mandalorians themselves... Strills didn't harm children. The creature probably had no idea he was turning 13 tomorrow and would be considered an adult. Holbar had said there'd be a big party once they got back. Obi-Wan had never experienced anything like that, but he was tentatively looking forward to it. A lot of the new kids who would come in with Master Plo would be there, though my brother wished he could share it with his friends at the temple as well. The Strill left in the morning, one more rodent in its belly. Obi-Wan set off, following the increasingly urgent whisperings of the Force, through a series of twisted canyons whose walls were painted in red, brown, and yellow streaks. He rounded a corner and had to stop and stare. The sunlight was partially blocked by the nearby cliffs, but it illuminated what felt like a Jedi temple to Obi-Wan. That could only be the Jedi Order symbol at the top, intertwined with the branches and leaves of a tree that seemed to be winding its way out of the building's upper windows. The force was urging him inside. He climbed up the stairs and pushed open the heavy metal doors. It was cool and still. Piles of sand and soil covered what looked like maybe a mosaic on the floor. Past that original floor were more steps leading up to an atrium which was dominated by the body of the tree he'd seen from the outside. Its long limbs and branches seemed to have crawled under the steps, the walls, and over the ceiling before it found its way out the windows. The red leaves on the outside weren't visible here, and instead it had a gnarled, thick trunk which overflowed the deep rectangle of dirt it had been planted in many years before. Like the Force-sensitive trees at the temple on Coruscant, this tree radiated the Force, making Obi-Wan want to just sit and meditate underneath it. But first, the Force was calling him onwards. Against the far wall, only barely illuminated by the light from the windows, was a series of alcoves. The central one held the cube, gently nestled in the recesses of what had once probably been protective padding. It fell away at Obi-Wan's touch. Obi-Wan knew a holocron when he saw one. He never handled one himself, but then it been demonstrated by Madame New in his clan's archives orientation. He hesitated. Jedi weren't the only ones who could make holocrons, but the Force was urging him to complete his exploring. 
He channeled a little bit of the force at it, hoping it wasn't one of the puzzle algons. It bloomed open like a flower at the touch of the force. The being hovering above it was a Mandalorian in full armor, except their helmet was held tucked under their arm, revealing an extremely pointed chin and tall forehead that suggested some non-human ancestry. There was a very strangely designed lightsaber at their hip. I am Mandalor, and do the master Tony Vizsla will met Adiga. He had a rather archaic accent in standard, but was still mostly understandable. If Obi-Wan had better Mandoa, he'd have suggested they switch to that, since apparently Mandoa had had less linguistic drift over the years. Obi-Wan bowed and brought his hand up to his chest in the Mandalorian salute at the same time. Obi-Wan Kenobi, sir, um, Mandalore. His babor had given him a lot of educational files to read to get him caught up on Mandalorian culture. The one on Tare Vizsla had been particularly earmarked for him, so we knew exactly who he was talking to. The temple lies empty. Then my sensed vision come to pass, asked Tare, looking around. Are you here alone, Obi-Wan? Obi-Wan nodded. I'm on my vet goat in Mandalore. Tare grinned at him, the expression looking a little feral. More Mandalorian Jedi, good news. I had hoped my saber returned to the temple of my death would draw others to follow the way. And call me Tare, or Master Vizsla. Um, I'm pretty sure your clan stole it back several years later. I'm not the only Mandalorian Jedi, but we're a bit new. Holbar had promised he could be the Mandalorian's dilemma after his word got in. When Holdan had first told him about the change in Mandalorian society, he hadn't understood just how galaxy-changing it had been, so he was looking forward to reading the book that had somehow transformed Mandalorian culture. What you bit? asked Tare. Obi-Wan winced. Tare had lived before the Rusan Reformation, so any dates Obi-Wan had were rather useless. He should have paid more attention in galactic history. It's about 1,000 years since you were alive, Master Vizsla. Did the cousin cousin for the look up to Boston? You mean the draw horn? Yes. It was about 700 years ago, I think. The Republic bombed most of the planets in Mandalorian space and wiped out many of Mandalore's peoples. The Jedi participated? No! They protested, but the Republic did it anyway. Obi-Wan had been very unimpressed to read that. The Jedi should have fought to defend the Mandalorians, even if that went against the Republic. They weren't loyal to the Republic, but surely doing what was right was more important than that. Tare sighed. I had hoped that all the preparations I made were for naught but alas. Sorry, master. This temple was designed to withstand the cataclysm and persevere. You must share with the current Mandalore and the Jedi that I have the seeds of Mandalorian plants sealed in airtight containers deep within. There be also what genetic templates and studies I could gather, and a holocron on my head. The red thitpok tree grows strong, I see. All that should help the current Mandalorians rebuild what they are able. Obi-Wan nodded eagerly. Master Vista's foresight was really amazing. I'll report it as soon as my word Galton is over, Master. That will be tomorrow morning. Obi-Wan sure was going to have a lot to report what without his temple and his stroll friend. Spend the night in here. There are plenty of rooms, though I suppose the bidding has dusted, mused Tare. I will. I just have some things to do outside first. Thank you, Master Vizsla. May the curry watch over you, Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan made his way outside, intent on setting some traps for food before he settled in for the night. He let the strill come into the temple, too, if they wanted to. The sunlight was casting most of the canyon into deep shadows when he came outside. He'd been in there longer than he thought. He had to study the ground intently, looking for signs of animal tracks, which were the best place to set up his traps. He was working carefully on balancing the second deadfall rock when all the light was blocked out. He started to turn. There was a sharp bite as his neck. He tried to call out, but his lips felt numb. He reached for the force, but it was slippery. So slippery. Then darkness.